Hey, what's up, students? I hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, I want to talk about a phrase you're going to hear a lot in physics when it comes to rotation, and that's something called rolling without slipping. Pretty much what that's going to look at is that how things that are rolling have both a translational and a rotational velocity. And when there's no slip on the surface, this becomes a very special case. Then we're going to look at an example of something that's rolling down an incline without slipping, and then something that's also falling towards the ground and spinning without slipping as well. And the thing that makes this a special case without slipping is that there's going to be no work done by friction, so that energy is going to stay conserved. So let's take a look at exactly what I mean. Okay, now this is going to be one object that's spinning around its center of mass. But I'm going to break this into three different pictures so that we can look at the translational motion, we can look at the rotational motion, and then we can look at the sum of those for the object that's rolling without slipping. So as this object moves from right to left, the points on this circle, they move with a tangential velocity that's going this way. They all are going to move at the same rate. And because all of these are equal, we tend to say that an object's velocity is centered around its center of mass. So whatever the velocity of the center of mass is doing, that's going to be the same as the points everywhere on this circle. They all move together in one straight line. But we know that's not the case for the particles that are moving in rotation. In rotation, we know that we have a tangential velocity this way. But as this thing is spinning this way, we see down here, the velocity tangential wants to point this way. And at the center of mass, there is no spinning, there's no tangential velocity. So V tangential right there is zero. So this is for the object that's spinning around this way. Now as an object rolls, it has both of these together. So if I sum up both of those, I see that essentially an object that is rolling without slipping, these particles on the top, they're moving translationally, but they're also moving with some rotation. So we see that this is actually... 2vt. And then if I take the sum here, I have vt and 0. This moves at vt. But then what we see here is that if I take this vt and this vt, those are going to sum to 0. And this is something that's a little counterintuitive. At the contact point, when there is no slipping, the velocity for just that instant is 0. Okay, the velocity of this particle at contact with the ground is at zero. And that's what I mean without slipping. Because that means if I'm not slipping, that means that this tangential speed and this rotational tangential speed are going to be equal. Because we know for work to be done and energy to be used, there has to be some distance traveled. Well, this particle does not slip to the right at all. It stays right here. So no work is done. So energy now can be conserved. Right, because what's making this object want to spin this way? Well, there's a force of friction that points this way, right? But you're saying, okay, well, does this force of friction do work? Because but work, which is equal to a change in energy, is equal to F times D. So I have this force of friction times D, but what's the distance traveled if it does not slip? D is equal to zero. So we see that when it does not slip, the delta energy is equal to zero joules. And that's what makes this such a special case. If this object did slip, then this D would be greater than zero and there would have to be some energy lost due to friction. But when this object hits the ground, the contact point is zero, the force of friction, although it acts to keep the object spinning, it does not change any displacement, therefore there is no change in energy, and mechanical energy is therefore conserved. That's super, super important. And, and this is seen when I have objects that slide and they don't spin, like a block, versus an object that does spin. If you just have a block that's on a surface, that block, we always pointed the velocity from the center of mass, right? But this block down here does not spin. So all it has is this translational velocity. Let's look at some examples of this and how without slipping actually helps. Okay, so in this example, I have a string that's gonna be attached to the ceiling up here. And what it's gonna do is it's wound around a pulley or like a yo-yo or something that's round. And when I let this object go, it's gonna fall four meters and it's gonna to start to unwind. Now the no slipping is gonna be, there's gonna be no slipping between the string 
and the pulley. So the force of tension, which is kind of going to be like the force of friction on the ground, this string is going to apply a constant torque, which is not going to change because the object is not going to slip. And I want to know what is going to be the linear speed of this object after it falls four meters. So this is a conservation of energy question. We say in the beginning that this object has some MGH, right? It has no speed whatsoever, but as it falls, when it gets down to here and as it falls four meters, now this MGH is going to be split. It's going to be split into kinetic energy linearly, which is going to be equal to one half MV squared. And it's also going to contribute to kinetic energy in the rotational aspect, which is going to be one half I omega squared. So when I set up my energy initial, I just say that I have some potential energy initial, which is equal to m g h. Now the energy final that this must be equal to because it doesn't slip, energy is going to be conserved. I'm going to have one half m v squared plus one half i omega squared. So when I rewrite this a little and clean it up, I say that this is going to be m. Now we know that this is the v of the center of mass squared. So that's going to be the center of mass of this object, which is going to be traveling down. So that's what I want to know this speed that's going to be happening right here. What's going to be the speed of that center of mass? And that's going to be equal to one half i. Now this is a solid disk, so I am going to tell you that i is equal to one half m r squared. So I'm going to plug that right in, one half m r r squared. Now the last thing here is omega, but I want this in terms of linear speed. So I'm going to have to use the relationship that we see of linear speed is equal to r omega. So omega equals linear speed over r. So I'm going to plug that in for omega here and I can't forget to square it. So that's going to become v squared over r squared. Now because there's only one object that's traveling here, the disk, I see that wow, the masses they don't even matter. And these R squareds, they can go away as well. So I could clean this up even further and say that GH is equal to one half V squared plus one quarter V squared. GH equals three quarters V squared. So V turns out to be the square root of four GH over three. So V, after plugging in all my numbers, I see that V comes into 7.23 meters per second. Now there's a side question here, and, he, and here's like the quantitative thing that the AP would love to ask. They would say, if this object was in free fall, would it be moving faster or slower? Right, the AP exam, they don't really care if you can solve for this. They want to know if I have a situation that's applying a torque and there's some rotational kinetic energy as well, how does that compare as if there was no, if this object was just in free fall? And we'd be able to see pretty easily that if I didn't have this piece, right? If I didn't have this, then gravitational potential energy would be able to give all of its energy to just the linear speed. And this object would in fact be traveling faster. So there's energy that's used up by this rotation that you know, had to come from this MGH. So after falling four meters, if it's spinning, it's going to be moving slower. If it's in free fall, it'd be moving faster. That relationship is super important to understand. Let's look at the same example on top of an inclined plane. Now in this example, I'm going to keep everything pretty much the same. It's going to travel four meters in the MGH direction. It's going to have the same mass, same rotation. This is a solid disk so that the I is going to be one half MR squared. And I want to know how fast is the center of mass moving when it gets to the bottom of the incline. Before I do that, I want to show you something that was on the AP exam a couple years back. I believe it was 2016. And I know a lot of kids made um, an error on this. And it wasn't to the fault of their own. But I just want to make sure that you guys understand exactly what's going on. And this is the same disc. I just moved it over here. And it's going to be rolling down this thing. And they asked for... The, the forces that were acting on this object. And you had to draw those forces according to where their location was. So I want to draw all the forces acting. And they didn't want the components. They only want the forces. So you need to understand where they're coming from. I think the most obvious one that most students got right 
was this force right here. This is the force Fg, the weight of the object that points down. Okay, most students got that one correct. The second force is this one. Maybe I'll use a different color. Okay, right along the surface, right here, this is where the force of friction acts. Okay, and they want it in contact right here. That's what's going to make the object want to spin. All right, this contact of friction. Now, the last one is where students made the most mistakes. A lot of times we draw the force of the normal right like this. It's a force perpendicular surface. But where does the force of the normal originate? It originates here. So when you draw the force of the normal, please, guys, make sure that it comes from the surface. Remember, the force of the normal is defined as the force that the surface puts on an object. So the, so the weight is from the center of mass. But friction and the force of normal, they both act at the contact point. So this was the correct diagram. And a couple, actually a lot of kids lost credit because they forgot about this part right here. And they drew the force of the normal from the center of mass. So I just wanted, while I had an inclined plane here, I just wanted to make you guys, you know, see that and understand that going into the AP exam. So now let's solve for how fast this center of mass is moving when it gets down here. We're going to see very similar to the last problem. A lot looks the same. We have some sort of energy initial, and then we have some sort of energy final. So the energy initial is going to be MGH. Then the final energy is going to be split between some sort of kinetic energy in the linear direction plus one-half I omega squared. Now, students ask all the time, like, Finn, isn't friction making this object spin? Yes, it is. But remember, that's what makes this a special case. I don't need the force of friction here because there's this non-conservative friction force is not doing any work. So although it's present, it is not doing any work on the object because at this contact point, there is no change in displacement. Energy stays the same. This is without slipping. Without slipping means that I can get rid of this term. Then it looks exactly like that free fall problem where I was holding it. One half mv squared plus one half times one half mr squared times the change at omega once again. I'm able to cancel out these. I'm able to cancel out all the m's. And once again, guys, I get the same exact thing. When we solve, we see that the center of mass now is going to be moving at the identical speed that it was. So how fast this object is going at the bottom depends on how high it's dropped from. But now this I is going to be a very big factor. So different spheres like a sphere or a hoop or a disc, they're all going to have different speeds when they get down here. That's really important. I want to write that. All right, so this is a huge concept to understand in AP Physics. Different rolling objects have different speeds because of their different eyes. A solid disc has a different eye than a hoop does, than a sphere does. But you could just solve for it. But back to that qualitative thing. Say I have a block of ice, and friction, therefore, is pretty negligible. Will the block be moving faster than the disc when it gets to the bottom? And the answer to that question, guys, is a big old yes. And the reason and the explanation, because you know they're going to ask you for an explanation, is that MGH is going to get converted into the speeds of this object. And a block does not need to take some of that MGH and use it for rotational kinetic energy. All of the MGH can be converted to that center of mass and that linear speed. So a block that's sliding down with negligible friction will be moving faster than a ball that's dropped from the exact same position. This right here is so important. Please remember that. Guys, I hope this helped clear up some things rolling without friction. If you have any questions about it, leave them in the comments below. I hope you have yourself an amazing day.